my dear student colleagues and all the viewers who are watching this program live from facebook page and youtube channel i would like to welcome you all to our international physics webinar so good evening to all here in bangladesh and a very good morning to all those who are watching this program live from usa i hope you are well and safe from corona pandemic uh, the situation is becoming worse day by day so we have to follow our health rule so I think we have already come to know that the Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology has started its online program, including online international physics webinar. And we have successfully completed our 226th international physics webinar. Today it's our 227th international physics webinar. And today we'd like to welcome you all to a joint session between our department, Department of Physics, Pabna University of Science and Technology, and the Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, USA, and we have with us uh, uh, here Dr. Uh, Anshul Pogar, sir, Assistant Professor, Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of California, Los Angeles, USA, and he has already connected with us, so I'd like to welcome our speaker. So, good morning and good evening to be here, and thanks for joining with us. And uh, thanks for accepting our invitation. So, before going to you, I'd like to introduce you with our student. So dear student and viewers, I think you have already come to know that the title of this today's International Physics Webinar, at least the light induced states of matter, very exciting uh, topic. I think you will enjoy it. And our speaker is Dr. Anshul uh, Koger, Assistant Professor, Department of Physics and Astronomy, University of California, Los Angeles. Uh, Dr. Uh, Anshul Koger is an experimental condensed matter physicist. Uh, he joined the faculty and started his research lab at uh, University of California, Los Angeles in the fall of 2019. He received his bachelor degree in physics from University of California, Los Angeles and obtained a PhD in condensed matter physics at the University of Illinois at Illinois at Urbana campaign. During his PhD, while working uh, in the lab of Professor Peter Abhamonte, he and co-workers developed a spectroscopic technique known as the momentum resolved electron energy loss spectroscopy M -E -E -L -S. Uh, they used this technique to provide substantial evidence for exciton condens uh, condensation in 1T TiAc2. From 2016 to 2019, Professor Kogar was a postdoctoral researcher in the group of uh, Nuh Jedik uh, at MIT. Uh, there, uh, he worked on using intense ultrafast light pulse uh, to in uh, induce non equilibrium states of matter. In particular, he showed using ultrafast electron diffraction that photon can be used to induce a charge density wave at lanthanum telenium 3. So I think you will enjoy uh, this session. Uh, and uh, thanks again for your patience. Now it's time to go to our speaker. So you, it's your time, Dr. Uh, Anshul, sir. Uh, you can start your session. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, nice it's a pleasure. Really pleasure for me to be here today. Um, and so uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how um, light can, you know, basically affect material properties and how, ma how materials can, uh, um, you know, respond to light pulses, right? Um, and to do this, I want to just, you know, to set up the talk, I want to just actually cover, you know, a little bit of history of condensed matter physics and put this, you know, field, at least this sub-discipline in the context of, you know, in, in its historical context. So. Um, if we look at, you know, the timeline of important events in our subdiscipline, which is referred to as condensed matter physics, um, basically condensed matter physics just refers to the, you know, um, the study of liquids and uh, solids, right? Uh, so if we if we consider the history of this topic, you know, probably there's a few standout events, but basically, you know, this chart is a you know, basically gives you some highlights of what's happened over the past hundred years, right? Um, one of the most important discoveries in the history of condensed matter physics was that of um, superconductivity. And this is where, you know, a, a, a material when cooled all the way down to low, usually to low temperature, exhibits absolutely zero resistance. So electricity can flow without resistance, right? Um, and, um, you know, a few, a few of these other ones are a little bit more esoteric, but um, um, nonetheless, there's one, one thing in common to all of these phases of matter that have been discovered, you know, in the last hundred years or so. And that is that all of these, um, 
all of these properties and all these phases of matter exist in thermal equilibrium. So that means that, you know, nothing, you know, I have a liquid or a solid and it's sitting at some specific temperature and that temperature, it exhibits these properties, right? There's nothing changing as a function of time, right? It's just the liquid is the liquid. It has its properties or the, or the solid is the solid. It has its properties and nothing is changing as a function of time. Um, and so, as I said, they all pertain to phases of matter in thermal equilibrium. So on the right, you know, you can sort of imagine that, you know, if I have, you know, the, the classic picture of things in thermal equilibrium is that I have, you know, a box on the left-hand side and a box on the right-hand side, and there's some, you know, some distribution of, of gas in the two boxes, right? Uh, versus the case on the left-hand side, where suppose I keep the gas on the left-hand side and there's a partition between these two boxes. And as I lift the partition, some of the gas is starting to go over to the side B, right? And um, in that case, in that case, um, you know, there's going to be some time-dependent phenomenon that occurs as the gas is leaking from site from side A to side B, right? And in that process, there's some non-equilibrium things going on, right? Only after some time will it reach this equilibrium where gas A and gas B are then at the same pressure, temperature, et cetera, right? Um, so uh, this is a process, just to give you an idea of what I mean by non-equilibrium, the left side would be a non-equilibrium process where the right side would be an equilibrium uh, state, okay? So the question then arises, why have we only studied, you know, matter in equilibrium, um, you know, in the last hundred years or so? Why are all these big discoveries happening in equilibrium, right? And so there's two, two reasons why this might be the case, is that either all interesting phenomena um, in condensed matter physics occur in equilibrium or because we have yet to put in enough effort to study um, condensed matter systems away from equilibrium, right? Um, and, you know, personally, I hope it's, you know, the second one um, because that's what I spend a lot of my time doing and I'm hoping to make some interesting discoveries. But, um, you know, we have yet to really answer this question well because it's still relatively underexplored, okay? So, um, you know, just to give you another simple example of what we mean by a non-equilibrium process versus an equilibrium process, you can think about, you know, if you put milk in your coffee in the morning, right, um, you know, on the right-hand side, once the coffee has mixed in with the milk, this is an equilibrium process, or this is an equilibrium state, rather, of the milk and coffee, right? They're mixed in, nothing is changing as a function of time. Um, whereas, you know, when you first initially pour the milk into the coffee, you see all these sort of interesting plumes of, of, of milk, you know, all these swirls and, you know, something looks like a vortex and this kind of stuff. So um, I would like to contend that this state is much more interesting than this one, but yet we've spent most of our, you know, uh, most of the hundred years in condensed matter studying things in equilibrium, right? Uh, this is a really just very simple example to just illustrate to you the kinds of interesting patterns that can form out of equilibrium um, in, in your everyday, in your everyday world. Um, I'll give you also another example, a little bit more, um, a little bit more of a sophisticated example from a biological system um, of something that can happen in uh, away from equilibrium, and that's the phenomenon of population collapse. Okay, um, in this specific experiment, researchers what they did was to study a bacterial colony, right? And this bacterial colony needs light to survive. Okay. So you need to turn you need to keep the lights on for the for for the bacterial bacterial colony to have energy, right? And in this case, what the researchers did, but too much light, too much light will kill the bacterial colony. So what the researchers did here was to turn up the light slowly every day, right? And then every day, just to see how the population was affected, they would just, you know, at this point P1, uh, you know, after a few days, they would basically kill a few of those bacteria through some sort of um, perturbation, right? So they would just kill a few and then watch how the bacteria would reproduce and then recover back to its original state, right? So before, you know, the bacteria is doing fine, they kill a few of them and then the bacteria comes back and they're fine again, right? And this is happening as they turn up the light every day a little bit more and more and more, a little bit more intensely, a little bit more intensely, a little bit more intensely, right? 
And so again, they apply a second perturbation and then it recovers, apply a third perturbation, it recovers, fourth. But as the light is getting a little bit more and more intense, there's more stress on this bacterial colony, right? And eventually, um, you know, after the sixth perturbation, not the, the bacterial colony doesn't recover anymore, it just completely collapses. In fact, all of the bacteria then die, okay? So this is what's referred to as a population collapse, right? And this, you know, is an example of a, of a tipping point in nature, right? And this again is a non-equilibrium process because something is changing daily, right? I'm turning up the light more intensely uh, day by day and this ultimately leads to a population collapse, okay? So this is an example of a quote unquote tipping point or you can think of this as a phase transition almost, right? You know, another example where, you know, a little bit more relevant to today's world is that, you know, you, we can imagine putting, um, putting um, more heat into the oceans and acidifying the oceans a little bit more with our, um, with, as, as we put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And as we turn up the, you know, temperature and the acidification of the ocean, little by little by little, you know, what's going to happen eventually probably is that we're going to reach a tipping point where everything just suddenly dies. Right, even though the temperature is being turned up very slightly day by day by day, suddenly it hits a point and everything dies. And so, what I'm showing you in this picture is a coral reef. Right, um, I believe this was the Great Barrier Reef, uh, some part of the Great Barrier Reef. And um, as you know, the temperature gets turned up slowly, slowly, slowly. Something drastic happens to this um, coral reef, and you can see that you know it just dies suddenly. Right, so you can see it's a you know robust and well not it's a very uh, you know, thriving ecosystem here with lots of fish and coral. And, you know, this is just a few months later after, you know, a, an, a summer in, you know, close to Australia. Um, and after that summer where the oceans got a little bit too hot, all of the coral reef died. Okay, so this is, these are two examples here of, you know, tipping points um, away from thermal equilibrium where you're changing a parameter as a function of time. Here it was light and here it was the um, ocean acidification or the temperature as a function of time. And it leads to a sudden collapse of some, um, you know, in this case of the bacterial colony and the uh, coral reef, but it leads to some sort of phase transition, even though the parameter you're changing is continuous. Okay. So um, let me just give you a, um, you know, the, the examples I gave you were sort of real life systems, um, you know, biological systems. Um, but in our case, we're going to be studying condensed matter systems far from equilibrium, okay? Um, and why would we want to do this? Um, well, one of, the, one of the questions, you know, that, that arises in our context is what happens to quantum mechanical systems out of equilibrium, right? So in those cases, we're looking at biological systems, which mostly follow classical mechanics. We want to ask, you know, if we have a quantum mechanical system, what happens out of equilibrium? Um, two is that one of the things we hope to discover is that you know, that there are phases of matter that are unanticipated that exist away from equilibrium that don't exist in equilibrium that we might be able to discover, okay? Um, one interesting thing about this is that, you know, in, in these quantum mechanical systems that we're studying, right, these condensed matter systems that we're studying, there's a degree of control that's offered to you when you study uh, systems out of equilibrium because the experimenter is usually, you know, changing the system in some way with some, you know, with some, with some external perturbation, right? So I affect the system in some way and I sort of watch how it changes as a function of time, but I can, there's a degree of control that's offered because I am affecting the system, right? And I think one of the main reasons why it's interesting to study condensed matter physics away from equilibrium is that it provides a somewhat uh, reproducible setting, right? We don't, you know, biological systems can be somewhat more complicated because they can adapt, right? So this provides a relatively simple and reproducible setting where we can further develop, you know, a non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, right? And the, these, you know, once we develop sort of that edifice to understand how these systems evolve as a function of time, maybe we can apply it to then the climate and biological systems as long as we have, once we have our uh, principles are well understood, right? And, you know, there might be other things out there that I've not put on this list, but, you know, that might evolve, you know, that might, um, you know, show up over time as we start to de delve deeper into the subject. So in most of my studies, what I do is I study solids, right? And 
you know, we want to ask, I guess, you know, if you want to disturb the system and watch it sort of recover as a function of time, as we did in that, uh, in that bacterial colony study, we need to ask actually, what are the typical time scales in the solid that would allow me to, you know, see this process, right? And, you know, typical time scales in the solid are basically the, these time scales for atomic motion, right? And the other time scale is involved with the uh, excitation of uh, the electrons, right? And so here I've listed, you know, the typical time scales involved in the in the atomic motion, which is in, in the region of, you know, in the you know hundreds of femtoseconds region. You know, a femtosecond, for those of you who aren't familiar, you know, you're probably familiar with a nanosecond, which is 10 to the minus nine seconds. A picosecond is 10 to the minus 12, and a femtosecond is 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Okay. Um, so in the ballpark of around, you know, maybe one picosecond, so 10 to the minus 12 seconds is a typical time scale for the atomic motion. Whereas the electronic time scales occur much faster because the electrons are much lighter. And these occur on the scale of, you know, less than a femtosecond. So in the region of attoseconds, right? So you can ask, how can we even access these time scales? How can we even look at things that fast? And so the, the answer to that question is we use a laser, uh, uh, an ultra fast laser, right? Which emits pulses that are roughly 100 femtoseconds in width, okay? Um, and using these lasers, we can actually perform certain experiments um, where we disturb the solid in some way and we sort of watch the system relax back to thermal equilibrium, okay? Um, and just to give you an idea of how these uh, experiments work, I think there's a really nice analogy to be made with um, this picture over here, okay? So this picture over here was captured in 1957 by uh, Harold Edgerton, right? And you can ask, how did he capture such a beautiful picture, uh, you know, at just an instant of time, right? And he did something, to capture this picture, he did something very clever, because you cannot just capture a picture like this on your camera. What will happen is you try to take a picture with your camera is that a few of these pictures will be blurred together, right? Because your camera exposure, the exposure time of your camera is pretty long. So what he did was to capture just a very sharp instant uh, with his camera, and you can ask how he did this, right? And so what he did was actually quite simple. What he did was he turned off the lights in his room, right? And he had a little, uh, you can think of it as a little like pipette or eye drop, right? And he put some milk in there. And so he dropped that drop of milk into this bottom pool of milk, right? And what he did was that he timed it perfectly such that when this, when the drop lands in the pool, a flash suddenly, uh, a flash suddenly uh, occurs, right? And he's able to, because the room is dark, right? The room is dark, he drops this pool. And when there's a flash, that's all the, that's all the light that is captured by the camera, okay? And by varying the time, by changing the time between when the drop hits the pool, and when the camera flashes, he's able to construct different times, different time uh, points uh, of what happens when the splashing occurs. And he can then reconstruct the movie later and say, oh, this is how the drop evolved as a function of time after, um, after the drop hit the pool. Okay. So this is relatively you know, simple, but um, we use a very, very similar technique in our studies when we use these laser pulses. Okay, so you can imagine that in our experiments, what we do is it's a little bit, you know, our, the way we capture the image is a little bit different, but the idea behind the experiment is exactly the same as this milk drop uh, photo, okay? And what we do in our experiment is we take one of these light pulses, the light pulses excites a sample, right, some solid, and that light pulse you can think of as the, as the drop hitting the pool. So it disturbs the, it disturbs the pool in some way, right? So the solid you can think of as the pool, the laser pulse is the drop, and then the, an electron pulse follows, which captures the picture, okay? So there's one pulse to disturb the system and one pulse to capture the image, right? So the electron pulse is like the flash, the laser pulse is like the drop, okay? And so the laser pulse disturbs the system, the electron pulse captures the image. And the way that uh, we do these experiments is that, um, you know, we have a very, uh, we have a pretty high energy electron pulse at 30, you know, in our lab, we're using a 50 kilo electron volt uh, pulse. And basically it transmits through the solid and you're able to capture a diffraction pattern on the other side, okay? And I'll talk about what diffraction is um, 
right now. So most of you are probably familiar with the phenomenon of diffraction, um, but let me just give you a quick refresher in case you are not familiar, right? Um, so basically what happens in these kinds of experiments is, you know, in this, in this, particular, uh, in this particular schematic, I'm showing, you know, some light traveling through two slits, right? And so this is a pretty famous physics experiment. And so, um, you know, basically what you see is that, you know, you get diffraction peaks, uh, you know, spaced according to how far these two slits are spaced apart, okay? So if these two uh, peaks, uh, so if these two slits are spaced by say a distance A, these peaks will be spaced by a distance roughly proportional to one over A. So as these get closer and closer together, these are going to get further and further apart, okay? Um, and so where I had more slits into the setup, right? So in this case, I have two slits. In this case, I have um, four, right? What's going to happen is that uh, the peaks are going to get narrower as I add more and more slits, right? And so the other thing I want you to take away from this schematic is that the peak width um, scales as one over the number of slits. So if I have many, many, many slits, what's going to happen is that these peaks are essentially going to turn into, in, or basically become infinitely narrow, right? As n approaches infinity, right? Um, and again, just one, just the last thing I'll emphasize this one more time is just that the, you know, the slit spacing affects how close these peaks are to each other, right? And so if these are spaced by A and I, you know, increase it to say 2A, these peaks are gonna, you know, new peaks are gonna show up in, uh, in the middle of these, right? I'm gonna have uh, more peaks as these get further apart. Okay. All right, um, so, now, okay, so now that we understand diffraction a little bit, we have to choose a system um, with which, uh, we have to choose a system to study, okay? And in our particular studies, we chose uh, what are called charge density waves. And these we just use because they're a very beautiful model system for our, um, for our studies using ultrafast electron diffraction. And what these systems do, at least for the purposes of our experiment, you can imagine the following, which is that, if, if at, high t at high temperature, I have a regular solid with an atomic array that looks like this, of course, you know, this is just one chain. What's in real life, this will be, you know, I'll have this chain uh, occurring in three dimensions, right? So into the page and, you know, beneath, beneath this chain as well, it keeps going. Um, but what happens is that below, the tr below some transition temperature, right? The solid spontaneously, um, you know, these atoms spontaneously have a partner. So they get closer to some neighboring atom. So these two atoms start to get grouped together, these get grouped together, and these get grouped together. And what you'll notice is that, look, initially I had, uh, you know, the spacing between the atoms was roughly of size A. Now my, my, I have a new periodicity, which is 2A. And so what you would expect in a diffraction pattern is that, you know, you would have a new peak show up, okay? At, you know, at once, once, this, once this distorts to, 2a, I would expect a diffraction peak to show up at one over, at roughly one over 2a. Okay. Um, the reason that we chose to study these charge density wave systems is because you know they were studied extensively in the 1980s and 1990s, and so we understand them relatively well. Um, they, you know, transitions can be uh, induced with them with a light pulse, right? And they can be characterized well with diffraction. And so these three, uh, you know, criteria, you know, made them an attractive uh, solid state system to study, and which is why we chose them, right? And so let's just look at the diffraction pattern. So were I to look at the diffraction pattern for this um, for this system here with spacing A, right? I would see the zeroth order diffraction peak, and then I would see a minus one and a plus one and you know plus two, minus two, et cetera, right? I'm just showing you the first one. But after the solid distorts, there's this new periodicity that shows up, which is 2A, right? And so what happens when I have this new periodicity of 2A is that I pick up a, uh, I pick up a diffraction peak at positions minus one half and plus one half. There's a new order of the diffraction, right? Um, so this is how you would characterize the charge density wave uh, with diffraction. When these peaks show up, you know that the system has been distorted, but if there's no peak over there, you know, you essentially, you know that you have this atomic chain. So um, 
there are two types of um, charge density waves. Those are referred to as commensurate and incommensurate. So for the commensurate charge density waves, basically, you know, th th this system that I've drawn here with period 2a is a commensurate charge density wave. So if this integer sitting out in front of the a is an is a rational number, right? Then we call it commensurate. So this has 2a, so we call it commensurate. However, you know, there are systems where the uh, the multiple, or, or sorry, this integer in front of the a, um, the coefficient, is not rational. And if the if this coefficient is not rational, we call the system incommensurate. So pi a or e a, that, those are irrational numbers. So we would call this an incommensurate charge density wave. Okay. And the reason that we distinguish between those two things is going to become apparent in the next slide. Okay. Um, so what happens, you know, we can ask what happens to the diffraction pattern uh, for an incommensurate charge density wave, right? And uh, basically we can look at the diffraction pattern before the incommensurate charge density wave forms. And so you, again, you'd see the, you know, first order diffraction, second order diffraction, third order diffraction. But what happens when the charge density wave forms below the transition temperature is that you pick up again an extra set of peaks, but this time it's not sitting at say one over, um, you know, at one half. It's sitting at some strange decimal spot or decimal point, right? So in this case, the left-hand side one would be one, at the 1.7, you know, roughly 1.7th order, and then this one is roughly 2.3 order, right? Um, and so, you know, by looking at whether or not this uh, is a rational multiple or not, right? This this is a little bit of, you know, it's a little bit imprecise, but looking at whether or not this is a rational multiple, right? You can figure out whether or not the charge density wave is commensurate or incommensurate. And the reason for making the distinguish uh, for distinguishing uh, the commensurate and incommensurate is that for an incommensurate charge density wave, there's a difference uh, in phase compared to the commensurate case. So if we go back to the previous slide, the commensurate in the commensurate case, the charge density wave has to sit uh, in such a way that you know it has a the the phase of the charge density wave has a ra it has a relationship to the underlying uh, underlying system, right? But for an incommensurate charge density wave, because um, the wave can essentially sit anywhere in the lattice, the phase is not pinned. Whereas for the commensurate case, the phase is pinned. The phase is pinned to the lattice. In the incommensurate case, the phase can really sit anywhere, right? And so, um, because the phase can sit anywhere, anywhere from zero to two pi, right? And the amplitude of the charge density wave is characteristic of how much the atoms move, right? You know, we can characterize the char the incommensurate charge density wave as a vector, right? Saying, okay, the 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 um, the length of this arrow, the length of the vector. Um, corresponds to how much the atoms move in position, right? Um, and the phase, you know, the direction in which the vector points characterizes the phase, uh, which says where the this wave is sitting in the lattice. So it can be anywhere from zero to two pi, right? And so, you know, you can characterize this as a vector. And so when I draw this picture in real space, right, of this vector, right, what I'm characterizing is locally in my solid, what is the phase? And what is the amplitude of the charge density wave? So most of the time, you know, when I form a charge density wave, you can think of it as being a homogeneous, um, a homogeneous um, system, right? And the phase and the amplitude are the same everywhere, which is why I've drawn the arrows like this, right? And so there's this really nice mapping that can be done from the incommensurate charge density wave to a ferromagnet, right? Uh, you know, you so you can imagine this as little dipoles, and they're all pointing in the same direction. So this looks as if it's a magnet. Whereas this one is an incommensurate charge density wave, but they really, you know, from a mathematical point of view, they actually look very similar, right? Okay, so one thing I want to emphasize is um, is that if you look at the diffraction pattern as a function of temperature, um, the, I want to emphasize that actually the peak width does not change, right? So when you go from the system from size A, to the system characterized by uh, you know lattice parameter two a, what happens is that you know you pick up a diffraction peak below some transition temperature, but this diffraction peak is always as narrow as can be, okay? And that's because what's happening is the entire solid 
is acting uh, in a, you know, in, in this kind of way where throughout the entire solid, the arrows are pointing in the same direction and have the same, uh, and have the same amplitude, right? So as long as it points in the same direction, as long as the system is phase coherent, as long as the phase is the same everywhere, the diffraction peak is going to have, uh, you know, the narrowest width that it can possibly have, right? And you remember, if we, I just go back to the picture of the diffraction over here, you know, if I have tons and tons of, um, you know, slits doing exactly the same thing, these peaks are going to be infinitely narrow, right? O there will only be, there will only develop some width once, you know, the the slits become slightly disordered from one another, okay? And I'll, I'll talk about that case uh, as time goes on. So the particular, uh, the particular solid we're going to uh, study is lanthanum tritelluride. Um, we chose this system because it's relatively simple, right? So uh, this is the unit cell of the crystal, right? And in this unit cell, there's a there's a couple there's one important there are two important sheets right here, and these are the tellurium sheets, okay? These uh, these yellow atoms are tellurium atoms, and basically what happens in this solid is that it forms roughly a square in the plane. It's slightly, uh, it's slightly anisotropic. It's slightly away from a perfect square, but you can see it's very, very slight. You know, we're talking about 0.9995 uh, discrepancy between A and C here. Okay, um, and that the, the, this this discrepancy is actually important because what then happens is that lanthanum tritelluride forms a charge density wave, so the atoms start to move along the C axis, but not along the A axis, and it's that that happens only because of this slight discrepancy. So lanthanum tritelluride, the transition temperature to the charge density wave is around, you know, way, way above room temperature. It's around 700 Kelvin or so. And it forms this charge density wave at that 700 Kelvin, okay? Um, you know, for some of these other heavier, so you can substitute, you can substitute lanthanum out. As I said, the tellurium sheets are what's important. So you can substitute the lanthanum out for other, atoms in this periodic in this column of the periodic table. Um, so you can put in cerium or presidinium or you know all of these sort of rare earth atoms. And what happens is that as you substitute in these rare earth atoms instead of lanthanum, say we used uh, thulium, right? What then happens is that the charge density wave temperature gets much suppressed. And actually what then happens in that solid is that you also get the charge density wave along the other direction as well at some finite temperature. But for lanthanum, we chose lanthanum because, you know, it's relatively simple, right? The transition temperature is very high, and there's not this other charge density wave that forms. It's, it's very simple. It's only one charge density wave. Okay. And so now I want to show you what happens to the diffraction pattern as a function of time after we excite the system with light, right? So if I look at these peaks, these are the peaks that arise from the diffraction, uh, from the uh, sorry, from the charge density wave, right? And these original peaks are just from the regular lattice. So again, let me just repeat that. So these two peaks over here are from the charge density wave. And so you can keep your eye on these two peaks over here and we we'll can watch what happens as a function of time after I excite the system with a light pulse, right? So there I excite the system with a light pulse. You can see that the charge density wave actually melts, right? And then it recovers as a function of time. All right, let me play that movie for you one more time. So you see the charge density wave melts after I excite the system with light, and then it recovers uh, as a function of time. And again, these movies that I'm playing for you are happening on a picosecond time scale. Okay, so this is these processes are happening very, very fast. I've just elongated the time so that we can watch it as a movie. But again, we can re re reconstruct these movies in the way exactly identical to the way that Harold Edgerton constructed his movies out of a series of images of the drop uh, landing in that pool of milk. Okay, so now what we can do is we can be a little bit more quantitative about our data, right? We can look at what happens to the peak intensity. So I, what I'm gonna do is I'm look, gonna look at the peak intensity of the charge density wave as a function of time. And so what happens is that you can see that the peak suddenly decreases in intensity and then it recovers, right? Um, so it takes about it takes less than one picosecond for the peak to decrease in intensity, and it takes roughly you know two picoseconds for the peak to recover back to its you know uh, recover back to some sort of slightly lessened intensity, but recover back to what we call quasi equilibrium. Okay, 
the reason that the peak doesn't come back all the way to its original intensity is that the laser pulse dumps some heat into the system also, right? And so as the system heats up, the peak intensity decreases slightly, okay? And so what you can imagine happening is that my light pulse is actually incident on the solid, which has the charge density wave in it. And what it does, my light pulse actually suppresses the charge density wave. So the atoms start to go back to their original positions before the charge density wave formed. And the light pulse is actually instigating this phase transition. Now, one of the really interesting things uh, that we found was that not only does the peak intensity also decrease, but the peak width also increases in the peak width also increases after you excite the system with light. So if I was to look over here and over here, so before the system is excited with the light and well after the system has recovered, right? You can see that the peak widths are roughly the same. So these are the black and red curves over here. Whereas if we were to look at what happens, you know, when the peak is very suppressed, you can see that the peak width actually is quite broad. And I just, you know, amplified the, um, I've just multiplied this by some factor so that you can actually see that the peak width is broad here. But, you know, its, it's actual intensity is quite low. Okay, so in addition to the, intensity getting suppressed, the peak width is also getting getting broader. And so you remember what happening, uh, what happens when I told you about the, uh, what happens in thermal equilibrium, right? I said that as you reduce the temperature, the peak width always remains the same. As soon as the charge density wave forms, the peak width is, you know, essentially that of a delta function, right? It's very, very narrow, right? Whereas here, what we're talking about is that the peak is getting much broader. Okay. And uh, so there's a contrast between what happens away from equilibrium and in equilibrium, right? And so we can ask, what is the origin of this discrepancy, right? Um, you know, again, you remember, as I add, you know, if my region where my, if my, if my, if the number of slits decreases, right? Remember, I peak, my, my peak width gets broader. So what we thought when we saw this, that the peak's getting broader is that there's, there's a region of the sample. There's some small region of the sample that is um, what we would call phase coherent. And it's in, it's not, there are several patches in the solid that are phase coherent or uh, phase coherent among, it, among itself, but is not phase coherent in total. And so one way that this can happen, it says, so th there's, it's characterized by some length scale, right? The width characterizes the length scale over which the patch is coherent. And so we can ask, why would the length scale decrease? And one of the reasons, the reason that we suspect that this happened is because, um, because of the formation of what we call topological defects. And topological defects are, are imaged in this uh, cute cartoon here, which, um, which was made by my colleague, Brian Skinner. Um, and this is the reason that I wanted to make the analogy with the ferromagnet and the incommensurate charge density wave. You remember the amplitude characterizes how much the atoms move right? And the phase characterizes the direction in which the vector points, right? And so let me just freeze this at two points. So in this solid here, right? So in this picture on the left-hand side, you can imagine that the phase is the same for every part of the solid. But on the right-hand side, if I was to form topological defects, you can see that in this region over here, the arrows are all pointing roughly in the same direction which is characterized by the length scale between these two defects, right? Um, and so what this tells us is that the distance between the defects tells us how close the, tells us the length scale at which we can expect to see the width of, we can expect this, sorry, the length scale characterizes the width of the diffraction peak, right? And this length scale is determined by the distance between topological defects. So if I have many topological defects, what's going to happen is that my phase the region at which uh, my solid remains phase coherent is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. So the more topological defects I have, the smaller this region is going to get, okay? And so basically what we are measuring in the peak width is how many topological defects we actually have, right? Okay, so that was the first thing that we discovered is that when you hit the material with light, these topological defects form, right? Uh, and that's different from what happens in thermal equilibrium by just turning up the temperature. Turning up the temperature, these topological defects do not form, right? So there's already a discrepancy between the two scenarios. 
Um, and, you know, a, a very like a very, uh, you know, simple uh, topological defect with which you're probably familiar is a vortex. So like a tornado or something like that. Right. And so you can think of these as little, uh, you know, tornadoes of of uh, of the charge density wave. OK. Um, OK, so let's now return to um, our phase diagram over here, which is I showed you earlier, which says that, look, if I take lanthanum and I substitute it with another atom, what eventually happens is that if the atom is heavy, heavy enough, so let's say thulium or something, which is a pretty heavy atom compared to lanthanum, if it's a heavier atom, what happens is that two charge density waves form, right? And so we had the idea that said, we had an idea that said, look, maybe there's this other charge density wave in lanthanum as well, but maybe we just can't see it for some reason because this, um, in lanthanum tritelluride, this, this, uh, dominant order, the C, the charge density wave that forms on the C axis is actually suppressing the one that forms on the A axis. And you can guide, kind of get an idea that the two of the charge density waves are competing because as I reduce the temperature, i.e. I reduce the quote unquote strength of the charge density wave, the other one starts to pick up. So as the length, as the C axis, the dominant order gets stronger and stronger, the other one gets weaker and weaker. So it feels like there's like some competition between the two charge density waves here, right? And so what I can do then is I can start to look at my diffraction pattern as I zoom out a little bit, OK? So again, let me remind you, these are peaks here are of the charge density wave um, along the C axis. But you can see that there's no charge density wave peaks along the A axis, right? Those are missing, right? So the A axis runs on the Y axis, and the uh, C axis runs along the X axis, right? So you can see there are two bright peaks over here, right? This is along C, but nothing along A. So I'm going to show you. So this is before my light excitation. And so what happens after I excite the material with light is that you can see these prominent peaks show up in the A-axis as well, right? So um, this happens very briefly after we shine the light pulse, right? And I want to show you a movie, actually, of what happens. But before I do that, I just want to give you a sense of the time scale, OK? So if I take, if I take a difference image, Right, of what happens after I shine the light pulse and subtracting off what happens before the light pulse arrives, I can see that in the red that the A axis uh, charge density wave starts to form. Right, And this image I'm taking at one picosecond after uh, the light pulse arrived. Right, uh, So this is happening on a very, very fast time scale. And if I do the same thing at 20 picoseconds, take a different image at 20 picoseconds, the peaks are no longer there. Right, so this A-axis you know, order only shows up for a very brief period of time. And so what we can do is, again, we can watch a movie, right? And keep your eye on this bottom square over here, right? And I'll play this movie for you so that you can watch what happens as a function of time. So initially, again, the C-axis gets suppressed, the A-axis shows up, and then the A-axis order starts to disappear, and the C-axis order starts to become dominant again. So in very, in, in very much in the same way as occurs in equilibrium, you can see the charge density waves competing. But as I mentioned to you earlier, in lanthanum tritelluride, you don't actually know that this A-axis order is still hiding there in the background, right? Because in, in lanthanum tritelluride, only the C-axis order is dominant and is present. You don't actually see the A-axis order in equilibrium. You need to photo excite, and that allows, you know, that suppresses the dominant order so that the subdominant order can show up for a brief period of time. Okay, um, so um, as I mentioned, how did the subdominant order show up? What we imagine is you suppress uh, the C-axis order with the light pulse. You know, it goes back to its original configuration, um, and uh, you know, basically, what we have the image of is that the two phases of matter are competing with another, right? And so we can ask the following question, which is how does the A-axis order actually form? Why, what's causing it to form? Um, and so the, it turns out that the answer is in the timescales, is characterized by the timescales. And so what you can see is that, you know, this is the plot that I, in blue is the plot that I showed you before of the C-axis intensity as a function of time. So you can see it gets suppressed, right? And then the order reforms as a function of time. Along the A-axis, you can see that the order starts to grow, right? The peak, in, the peak intensity starts to grow. And then at some, at some point, it decreases in intensity. 
you'll notice that the time scale is characterizing the decrease in intensity of the A axis and the increase in intensity of the C axis are actually identical, right? Of course, you can ask, is this an accident? Um, and it turns out that, you know, we can shine pulses of, you know, varying intensity. And no matter how intense the pulses that we shine on the solid, the C axis and the A axis always recover together in coincidence, right? So, you know, uh, the, for instance, a green curve recovers at the same time as this green curve over here, and the red curve recovers at the same time as this red curve over here, right? Now, um, so because the time scales are similar, we know that these two phases are competing with one another away from equilibrium this time, right? As a function of time. And um, we know that the time scale characterizing the recovery uh, of the C axis order has to do with the uh, annihilation of the topological defects, right? So the topological defects annihilate and then the order recovers, right? And so we got the idea that actually the A axis order, the subdominant order, is actually forming at the cores of the topological defect, right? And this might sound a little bit bizarre, but it's actually been seen before in a, in a superconductor, right? So in a superconductor, if you apply a magnetic field, again, you get these vortices that go through, so these little tornadoes. And you can actually see inside of those vortices some other kind of order form. So our picture is sort of analogous to this one, where when you excite the material with light, you form these topological defects. And within these topological defects, you have the subdominant order show up, right? The A-axis order shows up inside these defect cores. So, you know, this kind of experiment where we see two competing orders, um, it's a little bit, um, it's happening on such a fast time scale that, you know, it's almost irrelevant for your, you know, in some sense, it's almost irrelevant for the uh, properties of the material in thermal equilibrium, right? And so what we wanted to do was to move on from this original study and say, look, can we control the defects in some way? Can we make these things become slower? Can we make these things more permanent, right? So, you know, can we go from something that's like, you know, very, very fast sprinting to becoming like a little bit more like a marathon that's very slow, right? That will last for a long period of time. And so what we then did was we did a different experiment. We looked at a different charge density wave material. And this charge density wave material is tantalum disulfide, okay? Tantalum disulfide, we suspected that there might be some slower processes in this solid um, because, this, because it's a little bit more complicated, okay? And in, in tantalum disulfide, the way that the charge density wave forms in this solid is that the atoms, instead of forming, you know, along a chain and having these, these chain of atoms contract, you know, forming a 2A solid or something like that. Um, instead, what happens in this charge density wave is that the, you know, 13 atoms contract towards a central, uh, or rather 12 atoms contract towards this central uh, tantalum atom for forming a 13 atom cluster. And this 13 atom cluster, uh, you know, you can call this a star of David if you like. This 13 atom cluster can be tiled in two different ways, okay? Either I can tile the 13 atom cluster like this, right? Which we call the alpha configuration, right? Or you can tile the 13 atom cluster like this, which we call the beta configuration. And these two are just um, essentially mirror images of one another. So were I to draw a line across over here, alpha would be flipped to beta, right? And so these two are mirror opposites of one another. And so what happens when the charge density wave forms in tantalum disulfide is it has to choose either the alpha configuration or the beta configuration when it forms. And this you can see in the diffraction pattern in the following way, okay? So I've drawn this blue line over here, right? To show you that these peaks, which come from the charge density wave, will have to pick a configuration, alpha or beta, as I reduce the temperature. And so what I'm gonna show you a movie here, I'm gonna show you another movie here. This movie is as a function of time and not, uh, sorry, as a function of temperature, not as a function of time, right? This movie is a function of temperature. So as I reduce the temperature, what's going to happen is that the charge density wave has to either pick the alpha configuration or the beta configuration. And so when it does, when it does this picking, you can see, I'm gonna play you the movie now. You can see that the peaks rotated away from that blue line. So let me just show you that movie again. So keep your eye on these two peaks over here. You can see that the peaks rotate 
counterclockwise away from this blue line, right? And it had a choice. It could have either rotated clockwise or counterclockwise. And the fact, the fact that it rotated counterclockwise tells us that it picks the alpha configuration. Had it rotated counterclockwise, it would have chosen the beta configuration. And if you warm the sample up and you go back to the configuration where it starts like this, right? It has a choice to make. And every single time you warm it up and cool it back down, it's going to choose either alpha and beta with a 50-50 uh, with a 50-50 probability. Okay. In this case, it chose alpha. And so that's the material we're going to study. We're going to study this alpha material first. So if we look at the diffraction pattern, this diffraction pattern is characteristic of the alpha, right? Rotated counterclockwise, right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to shine a femtosecond laser pulse onto the sample, just a single laser pulse. And what we then see after the laser pulse um, excites the sample is that not we no we no longer just see six peaks surrounding say the central bright peak. We now see twelve. And when it when there are twelve peaks, in some sense it did not it no longer chose alpha or beta. There are both, right? There is both alpha and beta all in the sample at once, right? And what we can then do is I can cool the sample down a little bit a little bit so that you can see these peaks a little bit better. And so you can see there's really 12 peaks surrounding this central uh, central uh, bright peak. And what I can do is I, sh I can shine another laser pulse onto the sample and get it to go back into its six peak configuration. What I want to emphasize here is that this is not happening. Um, you know, this is no longer happening as a function of time, right? I shine one laser pulse and it gets stuck in this configuration with 12 peaks. Okay, this is a what we would call a metastable effect. It just lasts for an indefinite amount of time, right? And uh, when I shine another laser pulse, I can get it to go back. Okay, and so you can ask, what's the cause of these 12 peaks? And it turns out that if we look at a microscope image uh, using an electron microscope, you can actually see that there are actually regions, you know, after I shine my laser pulse, there are actually regions where, you know, in the red regions over here and here, Right? These regions are characterized by the diffraction pattern that has an alpha diffraction pattern. And these beta regions, uh, this beta, this blue beta region is characterized by the diffraction pattern with the clockwise pattern, right? And the alpha region is with the counterclockwise pattern. And so what we've done by shining a single laser pulse onto this sample is to create domains of various, uh, you know, create various domains with some with alpha configuration and some with beta configuration, right? And these domains are, are roughly microns in size, right? And those are just, once you form these domains, they're stuck, okay? This does not change as a function of time. And so um, just to summarize what we've done so far, it's we've looked at two different charge density waves, okay? One where when I excite the sample, there is this charge, this, this light induced charge density wave along the A axis, which is very transient. It lasts for a very uh, short period of time, right? But this other charge density wave that we looked at, where we in inject these domains and domain walls, that lasts for an indefinite amount of time. It lasts for basically forever, right? And these are just two different uh, charge density wave systems that we've studied. And so you can imagine that you know there's a whole slew of other kinds of systems that one might want to study using these techniques and you know studying systems out of equilibrium, right? In our systems, we're throwing our system out of equilibrium with a light pulse, right? Um, and I hope I've just given you a flavor of the things that we can do in the lab. And so, um, you know, this is this is essentially an evolving field. So, you know, there's much, much more out there to be discovered. Um, for those of you who are interested in just sort of, um, you know, uh, you know what what I think about, and you know, uh, uh, I, I have a little blog called This Condensed Life, which you can go read. And you know, one of my recent posts talked about why, you know, if you if you know the photoelectric effect, why that that doesn't imply the existence of photons and why why we actually know that photons exist. So in addition to doing research, I also write a few blog posts here and there. And if you're curious, you can go check that out as well. And so with that, I'd like to just uh, thank you uh, for your attention and um, I welcome any questions about all this. Yeah, thank you for your exciting uh, lecture. So we have got a few questions. So if you allow, we can start our discussion session. Sure. Yes. 
The first question, uh, what is the topological defect? That is a good question. So the topological defect um, is essentially a, um, it's essentially a, uh, let me see if I can find a nice picture here. Here, here we go. So the topological defect is characterized by a core. Okay. So if there is a, a region of the sample that doesn't, where the phase of the uh, charge density wave or whatever phase of matter is undefined at that point. You know, uh, in this case, it would be, you know, because the neighboring arrows are all forming in a circle, you would you could ask at the core, where is the arrow pointing? And that is, at that point, the arrow is undefined, right? And so a topological defect is characterized by a singularity of the, um, of this arrow in this case, the singularity of the charge density wave. So the charge density wave has zero amplitude, at that specific point. Yeah, thank you, sir. We have another question. So, uh, can a light into induced uh, Swiss uh, that twist the crystal lattice of the material Swiss on a giant electron current? Um, can you repeat the question, please? Okay, I can add the question. Uh, so, so it twists the crystal lattice. Ah, that's a that's a good question. So you're asking if um, ah that's a that's a good question. So um, you're asking if the electrons can control the material instead of the light, I guess, right? Um, and you know that's an experiment we haven't performed yet, and we actually don't know the answer to that question because um, we actually don't know how to generate such intense uh, electron pulses compared to our light pulse. Were we were we able to actually you know generate these really high current pulses or high intensity pulses rather? Um, we would then be able to answer that question. But as of now, I actually cannot answer that question because I don't know the answer. We don't have the technology to do that just yet. Okay, thank you, sir. This may be the last question. Okay. So, uh, what is the spin light of neutrino in matter, and uh, is it a new kind of electromagnetic radiation? What is this? Um, let me see if I answer, uh, if I understand this question. Um, I'm not sure I answer, I, I know how to answer this question. Um, um, would you like to repeat the question, maybe rephrase the question in some way? Um, okay. If the, uh, Ovinov uh, is listening to us, so please rewrite the question so that uh, our speaker will understand clearly. So maybe it's not clear. Your question is not clear. So could you yeah, please but write? anyway, I will. I will just say the kind of electromagnetic radiation we are using in our experiments is, um, you know, it's the same kind of electromagnetic radiation that's always um, that's always present, right? Like it's it's light coming from a laser. It is coherent, uh, which is what makes it a little bit special. Uh, but, you know, these, these pulses of light are, um, you know, they form essentially from uh, the fact that you can mix several different colors together. So it's not just one color of light. There's several colors mixed in together. And so once you mix in these several colors together, it, you can get a really short pulse. Yeah. And this short pulse is really what is uh, special about our laser light. Okay, so thank you uh, for your wonderful presentation and discussion session. So thanks again uh, for giving us this opportunity. And we'd like to say thanks on the behalf of the Department of Physics of the University of Science and Technology for uh, giving us this time. And it's our pleasure and honor to host you in our international physics webinar. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Have a nice day. All right, you too. Bye. Bye.